Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Humans like to play, right? We play cards, we play baseball, we like to play basketball. We go fishing or take a hike into the mountains. It's our playtime, time to recharge, to refocus, and to relax. This is Kurt Rappencheck, your host at the National Parks Traveler. Did you know that animals like to play too? And many times, our playgrounds infringe on wildlife habitat. But how does that affect their behavior? Does it affect their behavior? Today's guest, Dr. Joel Berger, a wildlife biologist based at Colorado State University and a senior scientist at the Wildlife Conservation Society, considers the world's wild places as his playground. He joins us today to talk about our human recreation and the impacts it has on wildlife. We'll be back in a minute with Joel. Smokey's Life, full of stunning photography and thought-provoking reads, Smokey's Life Journal is a biannual magazine produced by Smokey's Life, formerly the Great Smoky Mountains Association. Members receive it free of charge each spring and fall, and it is available for purchase in retail stores throughout Great Smoky Mountains National Park and online at smokieslife.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people, inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference too at friendsofacadia.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. You can show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Now for some great news. Now through December 31st, we have an opportunity to amplify the impact of donations to the traveler. Newsmatch, powered through the Institute for Nonprofit News, is the largest grassroots fundraising campaign designed specifically to support nonprofit news organizations, having raised over $300 million since 2017. Through the Traveler's Newsmatch campaign, INN will match any individual contributor donations up to $1,000, or sign up for a small monthly donation, and Newsmatch will match that 12x. Either way you stack it, donating now will double the effectiveness of your efforts. Your support enables the Traveler's Nonprofit Newsroom to not only help you explore the national park system, but keep you informed on how the National Park Service is managing the system and how Congress is funding and directing the Park Service. This daily coverage would not be possible without the support of readers and listeners like you. If you've been thinking about supporting the Traveler's coverage, now is the best time to do it. Your support will get the Traveler's Newsmatch campaign off to a solid start and help keep his newsroom on strong footing. If you believe in the work the Traveler is doing, please give to double the impact of your donation. Welcome back to the Traveler, Joel. It's great to see you. Hey, Kurt. It's great to see you. My only regret is that it is digitally and not in person. Well, we're going to have to correct that one of these days. I, I'll have to catch up with you out in the field. I think you have more fun than I do. <laughs> Uh, life is short, and so trying to enjoy ourselves, sometimes playing, sometimes other, is important. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm wondering, um, what prompted you to do this, to study this topic? I mean, play is a privilege in both humans and animals. How our recreation influences wildlife? What, what spurred you to look into that? Ooh, um, well, it, it, it's through the back door, and like so much of life, it was not planned. I had been over in Russia working with Russian scientists in Siberia on musk oxen and climate change and polar bears, and I got arrested. And <laughs> after my arrest, I was uh, finally released and came back to the US and reasonably depressed because my study there was terminated. And so I went to the deserts of the Southwest, specifically Southeast Utah, to seek some solace. And across a few weeks while I was camping, I saw some bighorn sheep, 
But I was also noticing zooming of motorcycles, souped up vehicles, throttled high level motorcycles, and thousands and thousands of mountain bikes. And so I started wondering about the impacts to wildlife. And my curiosity peaked. I applied for some grant support, found some. And, and I need to say, I want to thank a few people who helped fuel not only this interest, but contributed to my knowledge. So Kurt, can I just mention a few names? Is that okay? Go right, at, go right ahead. Right. Cool. All right. So Bill Sloan, Park Service, Kira Cassidy from Yellowstone, who's worked with me for four years. But then BLM and National Park Service helped support our work and the Colorado Natural History Association. And they've made what I'm going to talk about much more possible through their support and their knowledge. All right, I'm done with that. But it's really important to say that these people and organizations play a key role. Okay, back to our regular programming. There we go. We were, we were talking about Southeast Utah. I'm, I'm guessing you were down around the Moab area and whatnot. And it's um, it's a big playground for humans, especially motorized humans. It is indeed. And while I've never been to Fort Lauderdale or Miami Beach, my understanding is in the spring, those areas go crazy. Well, that's absolutely true for areas in Southeast Utah in the spring. It's like a virtual playground. Well, it is a playground and not it virtual. Is. No, no, it's a full bore. Everybody's out there to have fun. Four to five million people a year, most in the spring. That's more than Yellowstone gets. And people think of Yellowstone sometimes as not only the coup de gras, but kind of a zoo. Well, it's crazy in Southeast Utah in the spring. And it's a lot smaller. I mean, it's concentrated around Moab. I mean, it's not spread out over 2.2 million acres like Yellowstone is. Uh, <laughs> Kurt, you're always super good on facts and savvy. <laughs> and yeah, you nailed that one. <laughs> now... What do the wildlife do? I mean, there's desert bighorn sheep down there. Um, I think there might be some antelope. Um, but, but what about the wildlife? How do they react to all this human recreation? Great question. And I think probably all of us would be comfortable if the animals were totally habituated. So if, if when we go to a zoo, we can watch animals if they're not just lying down and resting. If we go to Yellowstone, the animals don't run away from us. And so in these areas of, of southern Utah, with a lot of exposure to lots of different types of recreation, the animals really have two choices. They can become habituated. Maybe that's not a choice. It's a desensitization. And then they hang and wait and don't run from us. Or the other option is that they are not very habituated and they get scared and they split, they run, they flee, they go up and down slopes, they disappear over ridges. And there's some mix of those responses, but by far and large, the typical response is get the heck out of Dodge, in other words, move away. And so unlike some national parks, the animals mostly in Southeast Utah, are not nearly as habituated. Obviously, there are exceptions, but by and large, it's not the same as being like in the Tetons or some parts of Glacier or Yellowstone. Because they have more areas to flee to? or uh, In Why? part because there's, it's probably less of a spatial restriction and more to exposure. And if animals are exposed to traditional routes where they know they're going to encounter people or vehicles, and those are frequent, and as I just said, predictable, they can habituate. But on the other hand, if people are all over the landscapes, if the types of vehicles are big trucks that are revved up, and then a mountain bike, then a motorcycle, then a high-speed e-bike that is silent, and all we, and if the, if the disturbances are not on the trails or the um, specific roadways, the animals don't know how to respond. Best example, you're driving through Southern Wyoming. You see some pronghorn on the side of the road. Pronghorn ignore you. Ah, but you stop the car. Then it's a different story. Same kind of thing going on, except that probably more disturbance and less predictability in some of these outback areas of Southern Utah. 
Well, I'm curious, you know, talking about habituated wildlife and you mentioned Yellowstone for sure, you know, you can watch um, bison, they won't flee too much. Um, moose are kind of hanging out there. Is it a problem to have wildlife habituated? I mean, everybody likes to view wildlife, but it's not exactly natural for them. And is there an impact? Yeah, that's a million or dollar more question. It's a great question. And, and scientists have been trying to deal with this. And I don't want to sound like a scientist say, oh, we need more research. So I'm not saying we need more research. Trying to answer directly to you, is it a problem? It can be a problem. It can also be a huge benefit. Obviously, in so many parks, tourists come to those places because wildlife is a massive draw. So what are the downsides? All right, so some of the downsides of habituation and I'll just give three, so I, I don't go on and on. Um, think about carnivores like bears or coyotes, sometimes even mountain lions. They become adjusted to humans because they're exposed to humans. Even as they adjust to being with us, sometimes they'll change their activity cycles. And so we know bears in urban areas will sometimes become a little bit more nocturnal to avoid humans per se. And so gradually they, however, become less fearful of humans. We have bears and we have cougars that will then, uh, not necessarily den, but be found under somebody's house, you know, in some open spaces. They can be found in garages. But gradually, when they become so used to us, and this includes in national parks, lose their timidity, then they can approach us for food or they might be more dangerous. And so that's one side and that's with carnivores. Um, we can take a different group of animals and think about bighorn sheep and mountain goats and they can get seriously used to people because they can access salt from us, either from us sweating or certainly from our vehicles if it's a winter area and the roads are salted. But there are negative consequences. One negative consequence is that we're bringing animals together. And so disease transfer can occur like pneumonia in bighorn sheep. Or there was a case in Olympic National Park where a semi-habituated mountain goat wouldn't get off the trail, gored a hiker uh, in the femoral or the femoral, uh, femoral vein was punctured and the guy unfortunately bled to death. Um, so we know that either through food provisioning or maybe even associating with people to gain safety from predators. So we could have moose, certainly elk in Rocky Mountain National Park or the nearby town Estes Park. People approach elk, elk are, are now used to people and then they kick the people, they can gore the people, they can kill dogs and all of this happens. And so those are just three different kinds of cases where in fact we find that habituated animals do cause problems, but it's really the people and it's not the animals that are the problem. Yeah, and I guess the, the conundrum of sorts is that wildlife that is not habituated to humans will flee, right? And so they might abandon their habitat or be pushed out of their habitat or, or into a smaller area of their habitat. I noticed in your paper, you talked about um, the convergence, I think it was in southeastern Utah, where the the desert bighorn sheep, uh, the females, um, they come down to, to get uh, the fresh, fresh vegetation. And it's a, a crucial time of year for them to get that. And, you know, the human recreationists might push them away from that needed food source. Yeah, especially in the springtime where the bulk of visitors occur. This is when female bighorns, which are generally pretty shy, are in their last trimester of pregnancy. And so what does the last trimester mean? Well, anybody here who has been associated with somebody who's pregnant, a human pregnancy, knows that what do the expectant mothers do? They have to eat a lot because there's exponential growth of the fetus. And so to bring the fetus into uh, a good living condition, a certain body weight is generally needed because it's more likely than to survive. Same thing for bighorn sheep. But in the springtime, when the first grasses are emerging, and these are very high in, in protein, 
that's when the bulk of visitors are. And so with visitors disturbing bighorns that are pregnant, they tend to leave the areas or they flee sometimes up to a couple of miles up and down hills, um, cliff faces, and they expend a lot of energy. But the important thing is that they can't replenish it right away because they don't have access to the very foods that they were disturbed or deterred from accessing. Yeah. A difficult question. Can you determine how much displacement is taking place for wildlife? Slight clarification when you say, how much area have we lost? Or are you asking, how long does it take before animals might return to an area? I'm not used to being asked questions, Joel. Uh, <laughs> hey, fair play there, my friend. I know, what goes around and comes around. But I'm wondering down, again, we'll, we'll go back to the Moab area because that's where you did a lot of your research. You're based out of there. I mean, in the springtime, there's a great influx of human recreationalists, and I'm sure they push a lot of the wildlife out of areas that they spend the rest of the year on. Can, can we measure that type of displacement that occurs in, in April, I think, is when the, the four-wheel weekend is? Yeah, um, yeah you're right. Um, lots of different encouragement for dot, uh, lots of different special weeks, and so different kinds of recreators come through. Some are pulling four-wheel drives, other with uh, uh, very robust all-terrain vehicles, some are motorcycles, <laughs> and then thousands of mountain bikers, just to be sure. Um, so we do know that uh, sheep are deterred from areas that they use for sometimes up to a couple of weeks. We also know that across time, like across a couple of decades, areas that used to have sheep no longer have sheep at all. And those areas have been open to more recreation and less restrictive recreation. And so across kind of the realm of areas in and around Moab, broadly defined, about, I don't know, some 75 to 95% of the area where there used to be bighorn sheep, they're no longer there. Now, that's not only because of recreation, though, that's because of a suite of other factors, but recreation in and of itself, the governing body, Bureau of Land Management, has done a decent, actually a very good job at making certain areas available for recreational vehicle uh, vehicles, motorized, and recognizing, okay, there aren't bighorns there, but then there's been a bit of a trade, so let's make some other areas sacrosanct. And that's what they've done. And so certain areas are very good for bighorns and lots of areas are a bit of a dead zone. Yeah, yeah. Tough, tough question. I don't want to get you in trouble with um, the, those organizations and individuals you mentioned earlier as far as helping you out with this study. But do land management agencies and both the, the federal government and state governments, do they take into consideration wildlife displacement when they're looking at different recreational uses. And the one one thing that comes to mind, um, there's been a, a debate in recent years over overflights of national parks and helicopter tours, you know, commercial tours from the, from the skies. And some national parks didn't seem to consider wildlife displacement. Um, and I know that's been a, a factor of some of the lawsuits. Do you think that the, the land management agencies do pay enough attention to impacts on wildlife? I would hope that we see more attention to less disruption of biodiversity, whether it's for big game species, whether it's for threatened or uh, smaller species um, in the parlance, um, non-game. Um, but it's tricky, um, of course, and everything is tricky. But I know that when we've been out in the field and we've been watching bighorns and helicopters disturb the bighorns, or when we've been out in the field and we see dogs chasing bighorns, which is a ghastly sight to see. It's, it's very disturbing, both are, um, and equally disturbing in different ways. When we've reported this, agencies have been not only receptive, but constrained. And so let me go slightly deeper. So 
agencies are constrained in different ways. And I don't want to go into the weeds on this, but for instance, when we've watched helicopters disturbing bighorns or dogs chasing bighorns, we've of course reported that to the authorities. The question becomes, which authorities have management jurisdiction? And that's where we are, as Americans, I think, failing. For instance, bighorns distur uh, being disturbed by helicopters. We reported that to BLM. BLM has no statutory authority unless the helicopters are landing in restricted areas. So they can just land. And so when we've had these discussions, they said, it has to be taken up with FAA, where helicopters are doing over uh, overflights. But FAA, well, private business, so that's commercial business, helicopter flights. But even FAA doesn't have authority for wildlife violations. So that has to go to the Utah State Government, which means Utah Division of Natural Resources, for their agents to investigate. And they have. But then it becomes a little thornier. Or the same thing with dogs uh, chasing bighorns. Both could be viewed as wildlife harassment, but then which part of the puzzle and who has the authority? So it's, it's really tricky. The agencies themselves, especially BLM, are receptive to that issue. Park Service is receptive. When we worked in Grand Canyon on helicopter overflights and John McCain, who was a staunch advocate for business and for um, privatization in ways, but he was also very, very honest. He opposed us and didn't like our research, which showed that helicopter overflights in Grand Canyon had massive disturbances on bighorns. But Park Service, Grand Canyon, they changed the rules and regulations based on data. And so, it's not always a, a zero sum game, but there are some victories. Yeah. So, Joel, I, I mentioned um, in your study, you talk about wildlife playing. Do, do wildlife play? Uh, do wildlife play? That's a really good question. It's a good question in part because the topic is complex. And it's like, well, what do you mean, Joel? Well, all right. We all know what play is when we see it. At least I think we all know what play is when we see it. But it's also an elusive concept, and it's like, how do you define it? So I, I'm not going to try to define it, but I'm going to tell you, Kurt, and hopefully listeners, reptiles play, octopus play, fish play, birds play. What's a raven that's got a piece of cardboard under it and sliding down a snowy roof, and then it picks up the cardboard, goes back to the top, gets on it, and slides down. It's no different than kids sliding on sleds down a field in uh, Utah, in Salt Lake, when you get your snow. You know, I've never seen a raven do that, but I, I have seen um, grizzly bears in Yellowstone in the Lamar Valley sliding down the hills in the snow. Alligators do that, except that not in the snow, but they bop <laughs> balls, they bop objects, and they slide in the mud. So does that mean that grizzly bears and alligators have the same kind of um, wherewithal in knowing that they're going to have fun? Oh, wait, I can't ask you a question. Sorry. <laughs> That's a great question. But, you know, I think we can we can turn to our, our faithful companions, our dogs and our cats, and, and they certainly play. I mean, our our dog will, you know, bring toys to us when he wants to play and he won't go away until we start playing with them. But, you know, you never think about that in the wildlife context because there's not a great, maybe there is, maybe you can answer this. There's not a, a play relationship between humans and wildlife or is there? Uh, <laughs> because of the advent of new technology, if we YouTube <laughs> a little bit, we'll probably find an elk or a moose playing with, 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 you know, some little kid, you know, not hurting the little kid. But usually it's play within the species rather than between the species. A connection, though, is that is if we're out there playing on our uh, motorcycles or mountain bikes, that's us playing, but we're not really playing with the wildlife. We might be disturbing it or at least getting them curious about what the heck is zooming past us. Well, yeah, and that's a great issue that um, the Park Service has tried to deal with. I remember, geez, back in the, the early 2000s um, when Yellowstone was working on its winter use plan and how many snowmobiles are too many and how many is an appropriate number, they did a lot of research into wildlife disturbance and 
from time to time I would hear that, you know, the snowmobiles aren't that big of a impact on wildlife disturbance because they can hear them coming from miles away, whereas the stealthy cross-country skier might just kind of kick and glide up to the wildlife and startle them at the last moment. Not only an ounce of truth to that, a pound of truth to that, a hundred percent truth to what you just said, Kurt. Yes. So, you know, a lot of people who are on the side of pure wilderness or maybe don't want motorized, a lot of animals, as you just indicated, recognize the sounds and they have a chance to prepare that disturbance is coming. And yet the mountain biker, you know, on an S-shaped curve, you know, a, a sharp turn, same thing for a skier coming up over a ridge where there's no visibility and there's a herd of something. Yeah, absolutely. The silent, um, the silent stalker not purposefully can trigger a lot of anxiety and then flight, but um, it's true for also for mountain bikes, um, also elect electric vehicles. Yeah, there's a big overlap, and it's growing, I think, um, in national forests and BLM lands as, as more people want to get out on their preferred method of recreation. Um, a couple of years ago, there was an instance uh, up in Montana where a mountain biker came around the bend and, and ran into a grizzly bear, I think, and the grizzly bear took him out. Yeah, a seasoned ranger. Yep, yep, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that, that begs the question— um, are there different levels of recreational impacts? And we just touched on it somewhat. Um, you know, maybe we can expand that discussion on, on wildlife habitat and, and what, you know, hikers versus mountain bikers versus cross-country skiers versus snowmobilers, you know, what sort of recreational impacts as opposed to, you know, running into an animal. Obviously, that's a, a great impact and you're, you're not going to win that game. Do one of those recreational forms have a greater impact on wildlife? Boy, um, as I said about 20 minutes ago, your questions are really difficult questions. They're good questions. They are the exact questions that need to be asked because if we have answers to those, we can set goals and maybe develop appropriate management tools to address disturbances. Um, our current state of understanding is, is far from perfect. In fact, we could label it highly imperfect, in part because context dependency matters so much. Probably the best way to think about it would be, I'm going to give a continuum, zoo, national park, and then open public lands. Zoo animals hardly respond to noise or to disturbances. They can, of course. Um, park service an or animals on NPS lands generally because hunting doesn't occur, have a more rapid rate of habituation, especially if they're re-exposed and re-exposed. But on these public lands, the exposures are varied and, and differ in intensity. And so asking if it does a truck, a four-wheel drive truck or a four-wheel uh, four, uh, SUV have a different impact, I hate to say it depends, but it depends. How fast is it going? What is the visibility like for the animal to detect it? What is the escape terrain that's available? And how much exposure has that animal uh, had? And so we could do, if we could do that with the best study design, it would be to do it independently. Okay, what are mountain bike interactions like? Separately, what is the sound of different vehicles like in and of themselves and how does that differ from natural sounds okay now let's add a motorcycle now let's just add silence and have a mountain bike going by at 15 miles an hour or an electric bike going by at 15 to 20. so they're complicated arrays and that we don't have a great answer for that one thing in your paper you said resource cushions affect both frequency and types of play what do you mean by that? What's a resource cushion? Kurt, I'm, I'm not blowing warm air in your direction because winter is coming. But again, a good question. Um, so thinking about resource cushions. And so there's such good similarities between privilege and play. And so let me talk for a second about privilege and play in humans 
which is based on a resource cushion, and then the same for animals. So what do we as humans do? We rely on resources. Our resources, um, the most essential are food and shelter and then protection of family. Uh, but our resources are monetarily based. And this allows us to purchase items. Um, and as I just said, maybe food, maybe lodging. But if we have a really good resource cushion, which means to some people money, we can buy trucks, we can buy other kinds of toys, we can go on vacations, we can eco travel and go wherever we want. In fact, there are something like 8 billion eco tourists in the world uh, every wow. year. All right, so what does that have to do with animals? Well, animals also have resource cushions, but their surrogate, their cushion is not money, but it's food. So just like people who have lots of potential funding, they can have leisure time, they can have their play time. So for animals, their resource cushion, as I just said, food, what does that mean? If you have access to good food, that means you have leisure time because you don't have to be out feeding all the time. It also means that you can have time to play. And we know that this actually occurs because studies that have been done on African meerkats, on Asian monkeys, on wild bighorns, but not my work, but others, um, also on deer and for domestic animals, those that are better fed, in other words, have access to more nutritional food, they've got surplus energy. So they can play more and then they have more leisure time because they don't have to be out feeding all the time. And so that's the analogy or the crossover between how animals are using their time and how humans are using their excess resources to play. You know, there's a lot of different impacts to, to wildlife and to humans as well. Um, there's a, a limited amount of resource out there, whether you're talking about acres to, to roam on or, or food. Um, we're also seeing a stretch in seasons. Um, the warmer weather is arriving earlier, so the spring season stretches out for the national parks. At the other end of the, the summer, the, the falls are nice and warm, and that season is stretching out. Certainly that has to have an impact on animal play and, and animal behavior because there's more people out there at those times of years, whereas 10 or 15, 20 years ago, they might not have had that. Yeah, the issue of climate change and how changing temperatures are affecting wildlife and play is just one behavior amongst other behaviors in a repertoire where animals can adjust. Um, we certainly know that as temperatures warm, animals have to adjust. And so whereas in the Sonoran Desert where bighorn sheep played more during the middle of the day, now as temperatures are warmer, play occurs more during just after sunrise and just before sunset. So as temperatures are cooling, animals are making better usage of thermally demanding situations. And we certainly know that this is also even true in humans. Um, you just think about what we do on hot days and how we adjudicate our behavior. And, and animals are doing that too. Is there some period where animals aren't going to be able to play because conditions become so inhospital? That probably isn't the first behavior that will drop out for them. There are probably other things that will um, become more important. Such as? Uh, feeding getting access to food, and then, of course, um, trying to not be eaten by predators. You know, there were a couple instances um, going back a few years. Uh, I think you, you mentioned these to me in the past about um, when the COVID pandemic was at its height in, in 2020, there were less um, humans out on the landscape for a while. Um, parks were closed and the wildlife changed its behavior. I think there was a, a recent story out of uh, Denali National Park with uh, uh, the park road closed at a certain area. Um, wildlife were returning to areas where they hadn't been seen for, for quite a while. Um, interesting behavior there, no? Yeah, totally true. Uh, and Bill Sloan, who I mentioned very early, who's been with uh, NPS in a number of 
desert parks and has studied bighorns. He, he wrote a piece also that was very similar to what you just described. And this one was for Canyonlands. And he was indicating he had seen sheep now, uh, after the closures where they hadn't been for two decades. Two decades. I think that that's what he had written. And yeah, interestingly, um, roads and wildlife don't always mix, even if habituation seems to be prominent. Um, Bill's example and the ones from Denali are certainly good exceptions or, or offer good oversights um, as to, yeah, we think we know, but we don't always know. <laughs> You know, um, decades ago, um, when I was working in Wyoming, um, a biologist up at Yellowstone Marimar um, would say how the bison there would use the roads in the wintertime because it was a lot easier to, to walk along the, the snow plowed road than it was to break trail off, off the roads. They're not dumb. <laughs> I, I don't want to take a poke at scientists, but uh, <laughs> some scientists from Flagstaff a long time ago, that they've retired, um, they indicated that animals use trails that make the most energetic sense. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, have they never watched uh, where, how a dog walks on a trail or how a coyote might use a trail or how a bison might use a roadway? So there you go. Sometimes um, I understand why scientists get kind of a crap because we're not using common sense as much as we perhaps should. Yeah, yeah. Now, not not to give it away, I'll just say that you and I have been um, in our fields for, for quite some time now, um, since the last century, um, late in the last century. What does it look like across the public landscapes, across um, the wildlife habitats, um, what human recreation is doing? I mean, we're seeing more and more Outfitters, you know, taking you on these, uh, whether it's a wildlife photography safari or or taking you into a remote part of Canyon, Canyonlands, not the park, but Canyonlands in southern Utah um, to go canyoneering. Um, certainly there's been an increase um, since we got involved in our professional careers. Can, can we say what it's done over those years to the wildlife and wildlife habitat? Short question. You want a short answer? There is no, no, short. no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> there is no short answer. Um, we, uh, as we push deeper and deeper into areas, wildlife has less of a reprieve. They don't get much solace. Even winters in these, de uh, in some of these places that are cold, like southern Utah in the winter gets snow and can drop down to, you know, zero to 15 degrees in the evening. The animals are not always getting their reprieve. So what are we doing to the wildlife? Well, obviously we're having impacts on them. Um, I think that agencies tasked with responsibility for land or for wildlife are doing some things that are very positive and they lead me to optimism as we move into the future. Uh, we certainly know that some sections of rivers are closed where eagles are nesting. We know that climbers can't have access to some places where they want to be climbing because of raptors that are nesting. We know that areas where wolf dens are are closed to certain uh, certain areas around wolf dens are closed. There are seasonal closures in certain areas. We also know that like for commercial businesses on public lands, for instance, wildlife touring, whether it's BLM or, or other Department of Interior lands, some of those places require licensing maybe all of them do but what that means is that their employees have to go through some training to understand impacts of wildlife and be exposed to this and so all of these seem to me to be important steps that agencies are making to try to just calm down what we're doing to landscapes uh, i mean i think about um, timed entry into national parks in some of the parks and where you have to get uh, you know sign up or you have to just wait and you can't enter for a while this is good because not only does this affect wildlife but it's affecting other tourists experience experiences when there is so much overcrowding and chaos and so 
there are population issues associated with us as humans and our impacts on the land are great. And the questions become how best do we try to tamp them down to make things a little bit better for the animals in those environments? Yeah, it, it's an interesting problem, um, one that's not going to go away overnight, that's for sure. Um, every year, it seems a, a different you know, the National Park System is, is trying to deal with uh, wildlife and human um, that, that interface there and, and try and keep the two apart. Yeah, it's, um, there are a lot of challenges. Um, the challenges are easy. The solutions are difficult. Well, Joel, thanks so much for uh, catching up with me. It's, it's interesting work that you do. I'm, I'm truly envious of uh, at least getting out in the field and uh, seeing the things that you've seen. But um, what, what are you working on next? Uh, we're continuing for another year or two if we can continue to find funding on this Bighorn project. And then we've got some work on the Navajo Reservation with a graduate student whose ancestry there goes back about 10,000 years. And that's focused on bighorns and domestic sheep and their interactions. And then I've got a little bit of work going over in Southeast Asia and down in the Patagonia ice fields, the tip of South America. Nice. Why, why the interest in bighorn sheep so much? Uh, bighorn sheep, they're iconic. Of the approximately 90,000 petroglyphs that have been defined, almost half are of bighorns which means that bighorns have played a very important role in terms of biocultural importance for a long time. And so if, if we can do something that raises the profile and keeps more bighorns on the lamb, land, um, I think it's <laughs> no got... <pun>. Some... <laughs> oh, thank you, good one. <laughs> it has some cultural relevance, and I think, of course, that's important because we are not the first people um, in this part of the world. Yeah, yeah. Well, Joel, thanks so much again. It, it's been a, a great conversation. I really enjoy it, and um, we'll catch up with you down the road. Kurt, I always love it. Yeah, you keep doing what you're doing. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. If you've been following The Traveler for some time, you know that we search out stories in and around national parks that touch on history, archaeology, paleontology, culture, and even sociology. All year long, we keep an eye out for those stories, and we welcome your suggestions so that we can continue to point you to interesting parks across the national park system and ensure that you know how they're being managed. You won't find this sort of dedicated coverage of the national park system anywhere else. And that's why your support of The Traveler is so important. Between now and December 31st, we're part of the nationwide Newsmatch campaign to raise charitable dollars for public service news outlets such as ours. As you can imagine, keeping the public informed every day of the year on all things national parks, from how they're being managed and funded to how to make the most out of visiting these wondrous places, requires a groundswell of support. We hope that you'll give us a vote of confidence by contributing what you can as part of that groundswell. You can find donate links on our website, nationalparkstraveler.org. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Parks Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.